We're going to be in Acts chapter 21. If you'd like to be turning over there. Acts chapter 21. We'll start in verse 27. Acts 21, 27. As you remember, Paul had been putting together a gift for those who were having a famine in Jerusalem for several months. He gathered together all that funding, made the long trip to Jerusalem, and then once he got there, he found out that his reputation was being sullied around quite a bit. Uh, instead of getting better, as he was trying to work things out with the local congregation and doing some things in the temple, uh, it got worse. And so we have three wild and wonderful accusations against Paul. And then we're going to follow that with just a quick three-part testimony from Paul about his calling and about his conversion. Uh, testimonials are not something that we do very much in Churches of Christ. Uh, perhaps you've worshipped with congregations where folks are called upon to tell about their conversions and they describe in detail where they were and what they were doing and how they came to a knowledge of the truth. I would love to know uh, how you were converted, how you learned about the gospel. I think it's a, a huge part of ourselves that sometimes we don't share enough with one another. So anytime you want to let me know about your testimony, I would love to hear that. Um, Paul is going to share with us a little bit of his, and of course, his is, is pretty majestic probably compared to some of ours, but uh, nonetheless, he is accused of three things and he gives a three-part reply that is worthy of our attention. Uh, you might remember last week, the first of the accusations was given to him by the leadership of the church at Jerusalem. After all of that work and all that travel, he shows up and it says he was received warmly, but then the elders and James, the Lord's brother, came together and said, you know what we've been told? You know what the people here in the church believe about you? They believe that you are teaching Jews in other places not to circumcise their children and not to pay any attention to the law of Moses. Now, I don't know what the source was for that rumor, but evidently it had traveled far and wide and the people in Jerusalem were believing it. And so James says, you have to understand we're a very Jewish congregation and we don't want the congregation to be divided over your coming. So they gave him a, an assignment to take care of in the temple that would help people understand that he really was one of them and really did care about the law of Moses. So go over to chapter 21, verse 27. At the end of this assignment, as he was getting ready to finish out the, uh, the vow and the sacrifice that he was paying for, when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd, and seizing him, they were shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled the holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul, and they just assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused, and all the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and some soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Not only were people believing that Paul was teaching folks in other places not to follow the law of Moses. They were convinced that Paul had brought Greeks, Gentiles, and actually brought them into the temple courts, thus defiling the outer courts of the temple. We're not talking about the holy place as in where the Ark of the Covenant was. We're talking about this holy place, the temple, the temple grounds. And so they were uh, beyond angry 
They wanted his life and they wanted it immediately. The Jews were not sanctioned to take people's lives. They didn't have the death penalty for the Jews. But they were just going to kill him on the spot because they were convinced that he had taken Gentiles into the temple and defiled that, that holy place. Let me read you one other uh, quick passage again. Um, this is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people against our law, and against this place. Does that sound like Paul? Not at all. But truth is pretty negligible if you shout a lie loudly enough. And these folks were angry, and they were shouting the, the lie as loudly as they could. And so people were coming from all over that area. It says from all over the city of Jerusalem. But imagine the, the acreage, the, the mile or two right around the temple. You could hear it was up on top of the hill. So you could hear the commotion. A lot of those people had no clue what was going on, but there was something big happening at the temple. And so they were rushing to go find out what was going on. And when they were coming into the area, people were telling them, you know that guy that I told you about, that guy that came from the Gentile area? He took Trophimus, an Ephesian Gentile, into the temple. Oh, well, let's find him and let's kill him. None of it's true. But that doesn't matter. All they want is some blood. They are in a fervor because of their independent feelings, because uh, Jews were kind of squashed at that point in time. And if you've got somebody who is bringing Romans in, bringing Gentiles in, bringing Greeks in, uh, it can't be tolerated. They found some ancient artifacts in the last 20 or 30 years. These are all written in Greek. They haven't found any that were written in Latin, which means it's a little bit earlier in the, the time frame. And the, the sign says, no foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself shall he put blame for the death which will ensue. Which is a nice way of saying, if you're a Gentile and you come into the temple, we're going to kill you. Right? There was a point at which you could not go any further. There was a court of the Gentiles. There was a court of the women. You had your place where you could be. But if you were not a circumcised Jewish individual, you could not go in to the rest of the temple. They believe that Paul had taken Trophimus inside that area. Uh, we're never told that they went after Trophimus. Did you notice that? Where is Trophimus? If Paul had him in there, why didn't they get him and kill him? Again, it's just a lie. They're just trying to find a way to go against uh, Paul. Let's keep reading in verse 33. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing. Some were shouting another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt? and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were silent, he spoke to them in Aramaic. The commander is asking, who is the guy? Nobody can give him a straight answer. They're trying so desperately to kill Paul that we can't have a conversation to even find out what the accusation might be. But when he gets him into the barracks or up on the steps for the barracks, Paul speaks to him in Greek. And if you've ever studied the life of Paul, one of the most important things uh, that helps Paul in his ministry is that he speaks Greek and Aramaic, the when you think Hebrew, Hebrew is kind of the written language. Aramaic is what they spoke. So he speaks Greek and Aramaic. Might have spoken some Latin, some early Latin. 
Um, he was a Roman citizen because he was born in a city that had citizenship connected to being born there. So he had lots of extra opportunities that some of the other apostles didn't have. But the commander says, aren't you that Egyptian terrorist that got together a group of 4,000 men and went out into the desert? Now, if he could catch this Egyptian terrorist, just think what his rank would would jump to, right? He's a commander in kind of an out-of-the-way place. He is looking over a garrison that's basically keeping the Jews in line in the backwater corner of the Roman Empire. But if he catches a terrorist that was 4,000 men strong from out in the desert, and he puts him on trial, brings him in to the Romans, then he's somebody important. So his rumor that he's heard is that Paul is an Egyptian terrorist and somehow he has caught the big fish. And again, a lie. Nobody understands who Paul really is, so they just keep making stuff up. Uh, Josephus was a very famous historian from about this time frame. He says that the terrorists that went out into the desert were a group of the Sakari. Have you ever heard of the Sakari? They were called that because of their swords. They had a little curved sword that they carried, and they carried in the back of their robes just in case they had the opportunity to get into a fight with a Roman. They hated the Romans. Uh, they had sworn to overthrow Rome if given the opportunity. When you get to 70 AD and the temple is destroyed, the Sicari are right at the middle of that revolt. So they're a very strong revolutionary bunch. Their home base was in Galilee. Jesus grew up around a bunch of these guys who maybe followed the guy out into the desert and were some of the terrorists. And the most interesting thing to me anyway is that Jesus had a guy in his group of apostles who is known as Simon Zelotes. The Zelotes is equivalent to Sakari. So he had a guy in his inner circle in that 12-man group that was a member of the Sicarii. So there were terrorists, there were Rome haters all around Jesus, all around Paul, all of their lives, but Paul was not a leader of a terrorist organization and had never led a group out into the desert. So it's time for Paul to give his explanation. Beginning in chapter 22, he speaks to the group in Aramaic. So they stop yelling. When they hear him speaking in their own language, they're quiet. And he says, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak in Aramaic, they became very quiet. And Paul said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, Suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they could not understand the voice of the one that was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said. Go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and he said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all the people of what you have seen and what you have heard. Now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized 
and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So beginning his testimony, he tells them where he used to be. I'm one of you. I grew up here. I went to school in the school of Gamaliel. I'm, I made a list one time of how many name drops are in this little section. The biggest one has to be Gamaliel. Right? He says, Gamaliel, a guy that you know, a guy that you love, a guy that you respect is my teacher. I sat at his feet in this city and I am just as enamored with the law. I'm just as dedicated to the law as any of you people are. In fact, I'm more dedicated because I persecuted the members of the way, what we would call the church. I persecuted them to the death. I was on my way to persecute some more of them when I met Jesus. So that's who I used to be. I used to just be you. Paul's somebody that probably would have tried to kill someone that was accused of the things he was accused of if he had been in the temple in his younger days, right? If somebody was running around saying, that guy over there is preaching against the temple, that guy over there is preaching against Moses, that guy over there is telling our uh, Jewish relatives in other places, don't circumcise your kids, don't follow the law of Moses. Paul would have been at the front of the pack to grab him and to kill him. He was holding the cloaks when they stoned Stephen to death. Paul says, that's who I used to be. But then I met Jesus on the road to Damascus and he tells of his conversion. This is one of three accounts in the book of Acts. You've got Paul telling us about his conversion twice. He tells the group here in Jerusalem and then later he has an audience before Governor Festus and he tells Governor Festus and King Agrippa and King Agrippa's consort all about his conversion. And so if you read all three of them, you get different little details. In one of them, we find out that when the voice spoke to him from heaven, it spoke to him in Aramaic. So when the Lord and Paul meet, they speak their native language together. Jesus addresses Paul in Aramaic from the sky. Um, there's a couple of things that Paul brings up that I want to to not miss. First of all, he believed that his baptism was in order to wash away his sins. Ananias said, arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. Some translations say, calling on the name of the Lord. And Paul taught and believed that baptism was the point at which forgiveness takes place. Now, if you read his uh, writings, you can't miss it, it's there. One of the things that has always been uh, puzzling to me is in so many modern congregations, so many modern churches, how they have taken an emphasis off of forgiveness of sins when they talk about baptism itself. Uh, Ananias uh, describes the process again as calling on the name of the Lord. And I, I just want to tie in one passage from Paul. This is from Romans chapter 10. And the, the, the larger section begins in about chap, in chapter 10, verse 5. We're going to start in verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So for Paul, we have faith, which... I think is assumed that uh, you can't respond to the message until you believe the message. Verbal confession, which uh, typically when we baptize anyone, we always ask them first, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And then calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, and in Paul's experience with Ananias, calling on the name of the Lord involved being baptized to have his sins washed away. So you can Mull that over and think about that. But 
Uh, it is called for, it is reported, it is common among the, the New Testament adherents to the gospel that they both believed and were baptized uh, for the forgiveness of their sins. Uh, let's keep going. Verse uh, Chapter 21, verse 17, ch I'm sorry, 22, 17. When I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying at the temple and I fell into a trance and I saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothing of those who were killing him. But then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now up until this point, his testimony is fairly well received, I'm sure. Right? He's giving them names of people that are well respected. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I was taught about the way by a guy named Ananias who was well respected in Damascus. The chief priests... The Sanhedrin, all these guys know me. I have a reputation that goes way, way back. But then he says, the Lord sent me to go teach the Gentiles. And it all falls apart. <laughs> they don't want to hear another word. They don't want uh, a man that they have already decided is telling people not to follow the law telling them that he's gone to the Gentiles. Their hearts are closed. Their minds are closed. There's no more opportunity for Paul to convince them, to change them, to move in a different direction. And so he is taken into the barracks for protective custody. And Lord willing, we'll talk a little bit more about things that happen after that. But here's a guy, again, who has done absolutely nothing wrong. He's done good things. He's done encouraging things. He's brought people into a closer relationship to God through Jesus Christ. What does it get him? He's been lied about. He's been beaten up. And now he's been arrested. All because he was doing exactly the right thing for exactly the right reason in the right place at the right time. So uh, you have to really admire Paul and his dedication to the mission that God had given him. Now, if you're Paul, does this day in Jerusalem make you want to go back and say, well, maybe I should spend more time with the Jews? No, and he doesn't. Uh, this really is, is a, even a more pressing issue that pushes Paul farther away from the Jewish ministry. He still will teach any Jew that will listen to him, but his main mission in life has become going to the Gentiles. Because Paul went to the Gentiles and because he wrote so much material to the Gentiles, we have about half of our New Testament from things that he was telling them about the Lord, about God, about the Holy Spirit, about worship, about all the things that he was spreading around the Gentile nations. Did he hate Jews? Well, of course not. He was one. He loved Jews. Did he hate the law? No, he cherished the law. But because others felt that he hated Jews and hated the law, he was pushed even farther into the job that God gave him to do in the first place, which was take the gospel to the Gentiles.